listeners, and welcome to the latest edition of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I remain Jason John Stone Yellen, mm. and the man over there staring at me while he's chomping on a little something remains Joshua Morrissey Hatton. How are you doing, Joshua? So we're doing editions, not episodes now? Is that a new thing? I don't know what we do. Who knows what we do, Joshua, from time to time? Are we like New Edition, the band New Edition? <laughs> we're all things to all people at all times. <laughs> the only thing I've said to you this week about Extra Extra is, holy shit, people are listening to this podcast. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, the Tour More and, episode uh, was quite a popular episode. Very popular. And then as you'll hear in the first half today, other people are listening too. So huzzah. <laughs> Regular listeners know that we will bring an article to the attention of the other. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll read through it in the first half. We will riff on it in the second half. And we always get out of here in a tight 35. Set your watch by us. I, I tried today, to. My watch fell off my wrist. It's like, I'm done. You keep trying to set me to it and it's not working. I keep reaching out to Apple and I keep saying this time on my phone is not correct because it doesn't align with a tight 35 yeah. from Extra Extra. <laughs> Anywho, as listeners will learn in this episode, we have a few tricks up our sleeve today. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to jump into a reading right now. And it was very popular. There's There's hubbub around this headline (laughs) and a number of people have mentioned it to me in passing i will say both my brother Mm -hmm. and our lovely charming chicagoan michael nolan sent us an email and i just realized now that i mentioned email i closed my email before hitting record so here we are michael nolan writes j and j more fodder for extra extra 16 million for a single cask of 46 year old Ardbeg. It is Oloroso, but at 48% ABV and will yield 440 bottles. And then he jumps into the editorializing business, which I thoroughly enjoyed in his email. He says, How is this possible? And I ask this question on so many levels. How are they getting this many bottles out of such an old cask? How are they getting this ABV out of such an old cask? How the f*** are they getting this many pounds out of such an old cask? Has the world we live in really lost their minds? Your friend, Michael. So here I come, Joshua. That made me think of the Fugees. Here I come, ready or not. That's, uh, what's her name? Uh, Lauren Hill. Yeah, see... Yeah, but my mind went to White Snake instead of "Here I come." It's "There I go." <laughs> so, so my or sentence made go. you think of something I didn't say. There That's you go. Perfect. Yep. So perfect. <laughs> so the BBC has a headline: "Rare Ardbeg Scotch Single Malt Cask Sells for Sixteen Million Pounds." So this story broke July nine. The BBC, as they are wont to do, does not attribute anybody for the writing of this piece. So we are just going to say the BBC wrote. And I, I know Murray likes us to riff in the second half and not in the first half, but here we are giving Ardbeg another going over an extra extra after they did the NFT where they oh, bottled the Ardbeg yeah. in the bog. And so, you know, we're, yeah. we're not purposely ragging on Ardbeg, but this was a big story from the week and we can't really walk away from it. So Ardbeg's about the big stories, right? I mean <laughs> Yes they are. Can you do? The BBC writes a rare cask of single malt whiskey has been sold by a Scottish distillery for a record sixteen million pounds. Ardbeg said cask number three was bought by an unnamed female collector based in Asia through a private sale. Experts said the sale had surpassed all auction records for a cask of single malt. Last month, a cask of the Macallan 1988 whiskey sold at auction for £1 million after being bought 34 years ago for just £5,000. It's incredible. 
sorry, a quick riff. It's incredible seeing a cask of Macallan 88 for a million pounds and then having Arbeg 75 surpass that by 15 million pounds. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, not like we went from one to one and a half or one to two, we went from one to 16. The only other riff that I'll add on top of it is thinking about Macallan 88. We were offered a few Macallan 88 casks early on. And I remember us saying, ah, we, we, we can't do that. Even if it's good whiskey, we'd have to sell it for $200, $250 a bottle. Nah, let's not do it. <laughs> the times they have uh-huh. changed, yeah. as a, a famous pop folk musician said. Yeah. The Ardbeg Spirit, we're back to the BBC here, Joshua. The Ardbeg Spirit, which was distilled in 1975, was originally laid down to age in two separate casks before being transferred to a single sherry butt in 2014, answering Michael Nolan's question of how did they get so many bottles out of a sherry butt, a 1975 sherry butt. And given the color, because uh, someone had posted a picture of the sample, it's not a deep, dark color like you would think 46 years in sherry would be. So, all right, so it's a bit of a finishing. Got it. It contains sufficient spirit to fill 440, 70 CL bottles, valuing each one at £36,000. Isla-based Arbeg said the butt would be bottled gradually for its new owner over the next five years. Each year, she will receive 88 bottles. Where we know that eight is a is considered a very lucky number in Asia. So mm. the doubling up for the 88. The cask is the oldest ever released by Arbeg, which closed twice in the 1980s and 1990s, before being bought by the Glenmorangie Company in 1997. The company has vowed to donate £1 million from the proceeds of the sale to local community causes over the next five years. There you go, a little bit of charity. The spirit's tasting notes on its aroma say, quote, Brazil nuts in toffee fill the nose, followed by linseed oil, a suggestion of flowering blackcurrants, sweet aromatic peat smoke, and a hint of tobacco, end quote. Ardbeg Chief Executive Thomas Moradpour said, quote, This sale is a source of pride for everyone in the Ardbeg community who has made our journey possible. Just 25 years ago, Ardbeg was on the brink of extinction, but today it is one of the most sought-after whiskies in the world, end quote. Andrew Shirley, editor of the Knight Frank Wealth Report, said that the cask sale had, quote, set a very interesting new benchmark, (laughs) end quote. (laughs) I like the... (laughs) Whenever my family say the meal that I've prepared for them on any given night is interesting and sets a new benchmark, (laughs) I don't quite know how to take that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, there's. I think those are very clearly not positive words at all. <laughs> A very interesting new benchmark. I love that. Whiskey expert Charles McLean added, quote, This truly unique whiskey is a remarkable piece of liquid history, an evocative taste of what Ardbeg was like when it malted its own barley. End quote, end article. Seeing as that was a shorter article from the BBC and was showing a, a pretty much unbiased opinion on, on what was going on, I wanted to bring in a piece from uh, our friend Dr. Nick Morgan. He, he wrote a piece for Master of Malt. And this is Indeed. not at all an unbiased piece. However, I feel as if he is writing from not just our perspective, but from the perspective of many of our peers within the industry and how this could affect the industry. Do you want to frame the 
the value of of Dr. Nick? Give give our listeners a little bit of background. Well, two things come to my mind first and foremost. A, he, he's been a Diageo archivist for years. Actually, I'll say three things that, that come to mind. So, so there's that, right? So he spent years and years with Diageo. He was also the mu- music reviewer on Whiskey Fun. So if you go to Whiskey Fun, mm. you not only find whiskey reviews, but you find music <laughs> reviews. And I thought his music reviews were absolutely fantastic. And then, and then thirdly, Dr. Nick is not just a keeper of the quake, he's a master of the quake. And when I became keeper back in 2019, he was the person who announced my name as I, as I walked up to receive my keeperdom, my, my quake. And so, um, you know, you and I have known him for, for years on and off yeah. different festivals. Yeah. And yep. yeah, he's always been a, a good guy. So, Master of Malt article is entitled 16 million pound Ardbeg cask a source of pride for everybody question mark now i do want to point out that this is a much longer article and i'm actually only going to read two paragraphs from the article okay so there's sort of a i wouldn't call this a subheader but something that the piece springboards off of And so it says, Dr. Nick Morgan asks if the industry really should be shouting about the record-breaking 16 million pound Ardbeg cast from 1975 that sold this week, the sale price of which is more than double the amount Ardbeg's owner paid for the distillery and all of its stock in 1997. There's a... That's a that's a fun little throwaway factoid that wow, twenty five years and we've got that little factoid. Well, Holy moly. Right. I mean for me it's one of the that felt like one of those things you you're digging through your pockets, you find some old receipts like, don't need that one, don't need that one. You're like, Oh, wait a second, I'm not gonna throw that one out. Yeah. Wow. So Okay, no no riffing. Yep, yep, yep. Riff free zone. So again, two paragraphs. The first one I'm going to read is right under the first subheader, which is entitled, Whiskey Investment Schemes, Disaster Waiting to Happen. The social media feeds of most whiskey-interested people these days are swamped with blandishments from a multiplicity of, quote, whiskey investment companies, all promising huge returns on investments in casts of whiskey. Companies are sprouting up like mushrooms on a late summer lawn and should be treated with an equal degree of caution. Following a model established by fraudulent investment schemes in the late 1960s, these huge promises of wealth are supported by claims of insider industry knowledge, immaculate industry connections, guarantees of no losses, and executed by ruthless, high-pressure sales techniques. And this is the part that I really want us to be paying attention to because I think he's, he's using some important language here. The proliferation of such unregulated schemes is a disaster waiting to happen for the industry, and then parenthetically, and of course, hapless investors. And neither the industry's trade body nor the large brand-owning companies seem willing or able to do anything about it. That last sentence, I think, is incredibly important to the conversation today. And then there's, again, this is, this is a, um, a longer piece, so I just want to close out this end with the final paragraph, which is entitled, A Lust for Money. So Nick continues, I suppose most writers and bloggers are fearful of biting the hand that feeds them, are too anxious to get on the next press trip, get invited to the next slap up lunch, get the next set of samples to raise any concerns or doubts about the 16 million pound cask. To be clear, this isn't just about Ardbeg and their cask, which I'm sure is pretty decent whiskey for a 46 year old. Far from it. It's about lust for money that's driving a stake through the heart and soul of Scotch whiskey. Everyone's in business to make money for their investors. We all know that. And I would be the first to argue 
that for many years, certainly in the 1980s and 1990s, Scotch whiskey was seriously undervalued in the marketplace. Yesterday's confident pricing has become today's preposterous pricing. Brand owners seem to be infected by a virulent pandemic of greed. It's a greed that's also driving those cask, quote, cask investment companies and their gullible customers. But it is a greed that's fraught with dangers, particularly when much of it appears to be directed at Asian customers and consumers. Greed tends to get found out. Brand owners should remember what happened to cognac in Asia in the 1990s and what happened to Bordeaux wines in China in 2011. End of article. Yeah, very, very serious words there. Very important words there. And as we, as we keep pivoting back to investment companies, before we get out of this first half of today's episode, I opened up today by saying, people are listening to this podcast. So we received an email from Zoe Jones, PR Director, Whiskey and Wealth Club. And we previously reported about a, a pending court case in Texas that was affecting Whiskey and Wealth Club. And Zoe wrote to us with the very eye-catching lead sentence for the attention of Joshua Hatton and Jason Johnston <laughs> Yellen, which, uh-huh. holy gosh, when someone's using my full name, I, you've got my attention. Hello, Joshua. Hello, Jason. I wanted to let you know that thankfully... There has been an update on a legal situation previously reported on One Nation Under Whiskey slash Extra Extra. On 7th of July, the Texas State Securities Board has completely withdrawn all seven, Zoe's words, false allegations against Whiskey and Wealth Club. Hmm. So there you go. So the... The email goes on, there is a press release attached to it. But I you know, we're allowing Nick Morgan these these unvarnished words. And so I, I thought it was only fair to give Zoe and Whiskey and Wealth Club some of their own words as well sure. to throw in here. With all of that said, this concludes the first half. And you and I'll be back in the second half to have a, a wee riff on all of this. needed that break that was quite the first half that we put together there we've got a Michael Nolan email we've got a BBC piece we've got a Nick Morgan blog post Mm -hmm. and we had Zoe Jones from Whiskey and Wealth Club holy moly like we ran the gamut for a first half and we still got through it in half of a 35 minutes so kudos to us well there, there are a few things that I, I liked about it is, you know, again, we, we mentioned this in the first half, right? BBC is giving you a pretty unbiased idea of what this story is about. Dr. Nick comes in with what has been our stance and the stance of many, many people within the industry of why this is not necessarily such a great thing. And then with Zoe Jones reaching out to us saying that the case had been dismissed and, and the seven allegations had been, had, been, had been removed. But it gets back to what Nick is saying, where there aren't any regulations that are a, a guiding principle on how to do something like this. So I can understand why a judge, you know, I'm no legal guy, you're not a legal guy, but you can understand why the judge may dismiss it if there are currently no regulations in place to potentially go up against. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair point. And, and I think pivoting back to Nick, where he says it, it seems in that first paragraph that you read, um, it seems that the industry either doesn't want to or is unable to address this. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we keep hearing across the industry 
is that the SWA needs to look at this incredibly closely. And, and then look, let, let's be generous, right? Let's say there's going to be a world that allows for cask investment. Let's all agree to the rules that govern that world. And I think to what you were saying a second ago, and in echoing Nick here, that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no rules to this game. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be many protections in place Thank for you. consumers. For consumers, yes, but really for the industry. I mean, this, I, I, I feel bad for consumers that are going to get into it and potentially lose out on a lot of money. Nick brought it up in his previous article. This is not a new story. These schemes have been going on for years. Plenty of people have lost their shirts on it. However, what I think you and I focus on is its effect on the industry as a whole. Yeah. Oh. And and I, I'm oh. I'm not necessarily against cask investment, right? It, it it's whiskey at the end of the day is a product, it's a commodity and people have place certain values on it and if they are willing to spend that money, they're willing to spend that money. I, I get all of that. However, if there are no protections in place for the industry, yes, some of the big players may not be negatively affected by it, but the industry isn't just made up by the big boys and girls at Diageo, yeah. Pernod, and Bacardi. Yeah. There are plenty yep. of smaller companies, your Gordon McPhail's, your Duncan Taylor's, uh, et cetera, independently owned distilleries, whatever, that are going to be affected by this because there is not a regulation in place to protect a system that had been working for the past 200 plus years. Yeah, a, a couple of thoughts come to mind for me is, is number one, our last episode, we were cheering the announcement of new private ownership for Tormor. Mm. Right? Yeah, oh yeah. Elixir Distillers get to be in charge of Tormor in Speyside, and Port Natruin on Isla when the, when the build is complete and they start running Spirit. And we cheered that. As I'm going through my brain here, Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, LVMH, own two Scottish distilleries, mm -hmm. Highlands Glenmorangie and Isla's Ardbeg. And yet here we are saying, oh, private ownership, you know, these two distilleries with elixir distillers bode so well for the future of the industry. Meanwhile, we're having our second episode about an LVMH move with regards to Ardbeg. <laughs> and so it just goes to show having fewer distilleries doesn't mean you're necessarily making the best decisions for the industry writ large. Yeah, no, there, there, there's no doubt about it. And listen, I don't fault Ardbeg for selling this cask, right? We, we have, I'm not going to mention any names, but we have friends within the industry who have done their fair share of selling a cask for 500,000 pounds here, you know, 750,000 pounds here. So there's a tradition of that, that, that has happened in the past. My concern is not so much the single cask that sold for 16 million pounds. Rather, it's how it affects everything. Like you would expect Ardbeg to have a crazy price, but when it starts affecting casks of Glen Talkers and Tullibardin and in, in all of these other distillates that either A, don't have their own bottling, their own single malt, or B, aren't necessarily one of the most popular brands in the world, right? All of these other distilleries, all of these other casks have been following along suit. And with this 16 million, we're only going to see all of these other ones go up more. And that's connected to the second thought that I had when this first came to my attention and Murray texted me. <laughs> really kind of put the kibosh on my weekend. But it was, oh boy, 
first thing tomorrow morning, cask lists are getting rewritten. Right. Hmm. <laughs> oh, one cask of 1975 Ardbeg can go for 16 million pounds. Okay, what can a 1990 go for? What can a 93 go for? Mm-hmm. Right. And then I, I could very well be pulling out years where Ardbeg was actually closed. I'm just making the point of <laughs> like, okay, if a 75 is that, what yeah. does it mean for this and this and now anything after 2001? What does that get priced at? You should see the and price of 1984 Port Ellens. <laughs> They're through the roof. <laughs> hey, I'd, I'd buy it. I'd buy it tomorrow. <laughs> and I know the joke you're making. And so, and, and so, yes, very much to your point is, well, what's the rest of Ardbeg pricing going to look like on a spreadsheet? But then also, what are other cask prices going to look like? And then I, I feel like in... The watch world, the car world, the art world. Oh, your Picasso sold for that? Oh, watch what this Van Gogh now sells for. Mm. And the fact that we have gone from 1 million for a 1980s Macallan to 16 million for a 1970s Ardbeg, where do we go next? 32 million, 50 million? Yeah, I I see what you're saying. I, I don't know if I agree with your comparison to art simply because whiskey is a consumable and art is is not. Like like I see I see the point that you're making, right? It it's it's almost, you know, uh, a rising tide raise, raises all ships kind of scenario, but it, but at least in the whiskey world, it's a finite product that's meant to go away at some point so, where art is So not. the reason the reason I make the comparison to art is that if you and I sit here and we talk with our listeners and we talk with friends across the industry, nobody is going to value a single cask of any whiskey for £16 million. Mm. And so it, so it doesn't exist within a realm that's connected to its consumability. It, okay. It's not in a realm that's connected to its flavor, right? And I know the BBC piece went on to give some flavor notes and then Charlie went on to talk about, you know, historical context. But 16 million is just a number pulled out the sky. You know, you, you could almost have a conversation that 1 million for a 1988 Macallan makes some sense when you break down the price per bottle and how much Macallan sells for when it's bottled by Macallan. And we just saw the the 80-year-old, you know, walking dead Macallan <laughs> get released. Yeah, yeah. R- right? There, yeah, there's, zombie there's a way you, Macallan. Yeah. Right, right. There's a way you could potentially reverse engineer to get to... Uh, I might not like it, but I I see where one million fits into this. Sixteen million is just out the sky. Like yeah. it, it's got yeah. no bearing on either the industry or the investment market or anything. It's just an awful lot of money for a single cask of nineteen seventy five Ardbeg. One of the interesting points about this was the fact <laughs> that there were two casks, two nineteen seventy five casks put together in a PX butt, hoggy, punch, and whatever it was. I think it was a butt. So they got 480 bottles, 47.4%, I think was the exact ABV, at least on the little sample bottle that I saw on Instagram somewhere. And isn't it interesting, though, that whiskey purists tend to shit on finished whiskeys. Meanwhile, this cask, which is... if it's not a single cask. It's two casks mm-hmm. married together, finished mm-hmm. in a separate cask. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that this massive purchase goes against what a lot of people have been, you know, prattling on about, which we know finished whiskey is just as good as every other whiskey. <laughs> I'm just surprised that it was a finished whiskey that captured such a price. I, I just hope this lady has the good sense to pour out the neck. Of every bottles, every bottle. so, so she's so she's only drinking the very best art bag that's in that bottle. Who was it? I think it was David Jennings who <laughs> who who did a tweet. He had a very funny tweet about neck pours, and it was it was something like, if if you 
poured out the neck of every bottle you had and put it into an infinity bottle? Would you have an infinity neck pour bottle? <laughs> I'd love to see somebody pouring out the neck of their infinity neck pour bottle. I would happily send this lady in Asia a bespoke bucket for her to fill with all of the neck pours. I would, I would take one for the team. I'm a good guy. You know that, Joshua. You know I'm a good guy. Except for when you call me nefarious. <laughs> You know, the, the other, the, the last thing that I want to say about this as well is it's a 16 million pound cask of whiskey. It's got 480 bottles from it. And they said each, each bottle was worth 36. 440. 440. Oh, 440 bottles. Is that true? Yeah. And then, th- and then 36,000 pounds. Yeah. You can trust me on that. I got the numbers. 440 bottles and you're getting... Uh, you know, each bottle is worth 36,000 pounds. That's just of the liquid. That's not your bottling costs. That's not <laughs> all of the other stuff that, right? It, again, this get, and I bring this up because if you take that logic that that's how much your whiskey is worth and you apply it to a lesser known distillery and a younger cask of whiskey and people say well i can sell this cask of whiskey for x because it's worth x no it's not worth that because there are all of the fees that that are involved from bottling and taxes and duties and shipping and and all of this listen 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 joshua we we got to get out of here in a tight 35 and we covered a lot of ground today a lot of ground i don't want to feel like a crotchety old man. (laughs) I really do get angry when I see these things coming across our desk and and I know that it really wound up Nolan as well. I'm I'm not going to begrudge anybody making money on their casks. You're not going to say to somebody, no, you know, we won't take 16 million, you know. Let's just call it 1.2 million and we're good here. Like, get, get what you can. I understand that. But it really does have repercussions for this industry in which we participate. And that's the part that we keep returning to yeah. and say this this is being affected for the worst. Regulations. That's it. There needs to be a process in place so that not just consumers are safeguarded, but the industry as a whole are safeguarded. Yeah. Dear listeners, if you want to write in to us, questions at onenationunderwhiskey.com. Also drop us a note, info at singlecastnation.com. Until next time, Joshua, we'll see what we cover in a future episode. But this has been Extra Extra. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, dear listeners. Until next time. Peace. peace.